Brother Daniel Dent here, and uh, he doesn't get to come because he's too often, unless we're in this area, so it's kind of a halfway spot for him. But I appreciate him coming on in and preaching for us for right now. Thank you. Appreciate the opportunity to be here. One of the hardest groups to preach to is preachers. As a pastor, especially as a younger man, I still I think I'm at least in that category, but uh, the longer I go, the least young or less, less young I feel. Anyway, we're going to be in uh, 2 Peter chapter 2 this morning. I'm just going to speak to you about something the Lord's been dealing with my own personal heart about. And I figure if he can deal with this preacher about it, then maybe the rest of you could glean something from it as well. And uh, I, I spoke to my church family about this Sunday night. And I'm, I'm burdened because in a lot of ways I think we're, we're failing to reach certain groups of people. Um, we're trying to, to fix that, or I'm trying to work on that in my own personal life. Not too long ago, we started a, a, a Bible study on Tuesday nights. We'll have one tonight. Uh, seeking to reach those who are struggling with life. And whatever that means for them, it could be alcohol addiction, it could be drugs, it could be any number of things. But I believe that there's answers in the Bible that can help those people that are struggling. I don't think they need another prescription. I don't, uh, I don't think they need another fix. I think they need to get their eyes on Jesus. I think he'll take care of all the problems. And but that, that preaches to me as well because I struggle with things. And I may not be struggling with the same things that they're struggling with, but, uh, but I believe that's a, that's a group of people as a whole that sometimes we just neglect because of what they're into. I'm not going to speak about that, that group this morning, but uh, another group that I believe so often we are not reaching because we don't like what they're doing. And we're not trying to condone what they're doing, but we do need to reach them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 6, And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into the ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that, should, that after should live ungodly, and delivered just lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. Yesterday was my anniversary. I've been married for 19 years and a whole lot of things have changed in the last 19 years. I was married in the month of June, and of course that has taken on a whole new meaning in our current situation. Uh, it, it is a month for celebrating sin, and it, it's not something I agree with. It's not something I want. I don't like to see it in the stores. I don't like to see it on the television. But in my lifetime, I've seen things go from something that hardly anyone ever talked about and and something that hardly anyone ever knew anyone that was involved in something like that. To them starting to come out of the closet and starting uh, to push it upon us. And beginning to make us think that everything's normal when you act that way. And you do those things. And, and it's so blatant and open and it, it's sinful just as it was 19, 20 years ago. I remember the first time I ever met someone that said they were that way. And I was just blown away. I was, I was still in high school. And uh, it did not even compute what they were saying. I could not imagine why someone would think that they should like someone of the same sex. It just doesn't. It's unnatural. It's, it's not according to the, the plan that God made it. And if we're not careful, we will... In, in our zeal, I believe, to keep ourselves unspotted from the world that will distance ourselves from people who need to be reached with the gospel of Jesus Christ and whose only hope from getting out of that is finding a relationship with God. Right. Or, if they already know Him, from getting right with Him. 
I want to consider for just a few moments this question, are we reaching Sodom? In the biblical Sodom, we find that there was at least one man who was there who had an opportunity to reach Sodom. I don't think he did a very good job at it. But frankly, we're not doing a very good job at it either. Uh, Sodom was a, a, a wicked place, but the truth of the matter is that Lot chose to be there. And you can read it in Genesis chapter number 13. He looked and he saw something and it, it pleased him and he said, I'm going to go that direction. It didn't start out with him living in that place. But when he pitched his tent, the Bible says he pitched his tent towards Sodom. And then God tells us that the men of Sodom were, were sinners exceedingly before the Lord. Right. That ought to tell us something just to begin with before we even know anything about that place. That if God says it's sinful, then we ought to know that this is a place we shouldn't be messing around with. Sodom's sin was more than just great wickedness, and even as Peter mentions here, it was more than just ungodliness. In Jude, we find a very similar commentary of, uh, of these same things. In verse number 7 of the book of Jude, it says, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. They were, they were rejecting God's way. They were doing whatsoever they pleased. They were, they were doing things that they ought not to be doing. And, and there's consequences for those things. There's, there's the judgment of God that came upon those cities as a result of their sin and their unwillingness to repent, regardless of how little light they had, regardless of the witness that they had. At least Lot was there to... To witness against them. They didn't listen. In Romans chapter 1 we find a great list of things that Paul deals with of what happens when you totally reject God and God's way and, and part of that is this, this very sinful nature. In verse 26 of Romans chapter 1 it says, for this cause God gave them up to vile affections for even the women to change the natural use and to that which is against nature, and likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned their lusts one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves the recompense of the error that was meet. Instead of worshiping God as they knew they should have been worshiping God, they worshiped, the Bible says in the previous verses, they worshiped and served the creature more than the creator. And this is the reason why it led to this. They rejected God, and so God allowed them to do whatever their heart desired. And that ended up being something vile and filthy and, and unnatural. But all of sin leads to, to other sin and eventually a reprobate mind that Paul speaks about here. Where they don't even know the difference between what's right and wrong. Nor do they care. Just read the rest of Romans chapter number 1. The end is much like we find the, the book of Judges. Every man doing what's right in their own eyes. And when we do what's right in our own eyes, we're not doing what's pleasing to the Lord. Isaiah chapter 3 and verse number 9. It's not just their, their outward gross sin that we think of. When we think of Sodom, it was, it was their heart filled with pride about what they were doing with. And isn't that exactly what we're seeing today? This is pride month. And Number one, pride is an abomination. Pride is against God in all forms. And if we've gotten to the place where we're proud of the sin that we're committing, we're in a bad place. Yeah. Right. Isaiah 3 verse 9 says, to The show of their countenance doth witness against them. They declare their sin as Sodom. They hide it not. The natural thing to do for those of us... Uh, the, what we don't, we shouldn't do, but the natural thing we want to do when we sin, we want to hide it. Yeah. Because we're ashamed of it. That's what Adam and Eve did in the garden. Now, it didn't cover their sin. It didn't take care of it. It didn't do anything to deal with it. But that's the way naturally we feel when we understand that there's a God in heaven that we've got to answer to. When we sin, we don't want him to know about it. 
And our world's got to the place today where they, they don't care if God knows about it because they don't care about God. They don't believe in God. And so they're so proud of themselves that they're sinners. In fact, it gets worse than that. It wasn't just pride. There's a whole list of things. Ezekiel deals with those things. Ezekiel chapter 16. They only cared for themselves. They did whatsoever they pleased. They committed abomination against God. And so God chose to destroy that place. But the truth of the matter is we're living in a place that's much like Sodom. You can't get away from this lifestyle. You can't get away from the promotion of it. You can't get away from, from any of it most of the year. And it's even worse this month. It's frustrating. You know what Ezekiel was, was saying as, as Ezekiel lists? He says this was the sin of Sodom, pride and fullness of bread and lots of different things he mentions. But you know what he's doing? He's comparing Judah to Sodom. You know what he says about Judah? Judah was worse than Sodom. If you think Sodom was bad, Judah was worse. You know what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 11? He compares the cities of Capernaum, the cities of Chorazin and Bethsaida and he says if the mighty works which were done in these cities had been done in Tyre and Sidon he first says and then he says if they'd been done in Sodom they would have repented if Sodom had had the light of the world Jesus Christ if Sodom had seen the miracles that Jesus had done if Sodom had been around in Jesus day and he had gone to it they would have repented sackcloth and ashes and so Jesus says it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for Capernaum it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than it will for Chorazin and Bethsaida because they saw the Savior and they rejected him Sodom didn't have that light but what are we to be we're to be the salt of the earth we're to be the light of the world why because we have the light of the of the Savior in us. The, the light of the glorious gospel has shined unto us. And while Lot had a choice to live in Sodom, we really don't have that choice. We can't go anywhere and get away from it. The question is, are we reaching Sodom? Are we trying to reach those who are in this bond? You know what it is? It's sin. You know what it is? It binds them from from the truth. You know what it is? The devil uses it to blind them from what they need. Are we seeking to reach them? Are we, or do we see them and ignore them? Do we pass by on the other side? They're just like that man that fell among thieves that's wounded and hurting and needing someone to have compassion on them and someone to, to reach out their hand and someone to lift them up and someone to pour oil and wine in their wounds and someone to take them on their horse and take them to the end and, and, and show them the love of Jesus. That's right. Amen. Number one, do we want to reach them? I think that's where it begins. If we're not reaching them, it's because we don't want to. And that goes with anybody. You know, there's lots of groups of people that we don't agree with. There's lots of religions that we might, we might pass on, on trying to take them on and explain to them who Jesus is. And, and there's, there's lots of people that we look at and we might say, well, they don't look like they would ever respond to the truth of the gospel. I'll just not give that to them. But the reality is if we don't want to give the gospel to someone, we're not going to give the gospel to them. Do we want to reach them. And, and we have all kinds of excuses. We have all kinds of arguments. We, we try to justify why we should not reach this group of people. Yes, they're sinners. I understand that. What they're doing is abomination. That's right. You know what? They could influence our families and our church and our kids. Yeah. They could try to do things that are abominable and we would have to put up with that. We'd have to see that. We'd have to witness that. True. But the, but the reality is we can't just build a wall around our church and a wall around our house and keep the world totally out and just ignore the fact that they exist and they're there. That It's gotten to the point where you probably know people personally that are struggling with this. 
It's frustrating to see kids that grew up in good churches that know better, that, that, that had such promise in our own minds, as we think, of doing something great and wonderful for the Lord, get caught up in this lie that, that, that God made them this way, that, they, that they've made a choice to go this direction, and it's okay, and God's okay with it. We can't just segregate ourselves from the world. We're not supposed to do that. God, in Jesus' high priestly prayer in John chapter 17, he says in verse number 15, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from evil. And so it's seeking to reach the world. We don't want to become like the world. We don't want to let the world influence us, but we want to influence them. We want to help have the help of God to keep us from evil, but to reach them with the gospel of Christ. See, our arguments about why we shouldn't, that's not a good enough excuse. Well, consider their agenda. As we think about what they're trying to accomplish in this world, I think sometimes we get a little squeamish and we think, well, they're, they're, they, they've said this is what they're trying to do. They, they've come out and said they want our children. They want to reach them. They're, they're doing an awful good job of it in the school system. They're, they're doing an awful good job of it on the television and in media and everywhere. It's so blatant and open in the grocery stores. You can't go shopping in the month of June without seeing it everywhere. Their agenda is real. They want to make it appealing. I'm sure Sodom was a pretty place. It attracted Lot, his family. I'm sure they put on a good outward appearance. But isn't that exactly what the media does to this lifestyle? It makes you want to think, well, they're, they're happy. I mean... They use the word gay that means happy, and they've perverted that to promote their lifestyle, and they're not at all happy. You know why? Because they're missing the most important thing. They're missing God. They make it appealing. They want to make it acceptable. That, that way I felt the very first time I met someone like that, to be honest with you, it doesn't shock me so much to see people out in public doing those things. That's a little disturbing about my own self. You know why? Because we see it day in and day out. They talk to us about it day in and day out. You see it on movies. You see it uh, on commercials. You see it broadcasted in the stores. And I know what the rainbow means. It doesn't mean that all love is love. It means that God has promised not to flood the earth as a way of judgment. It's a, it's a sign that God's good. And yet, when we see it this month, all we can think about is their sinfulness. I don't want to get used to seeing two men giving affection to each other. That's not right. Now, I have no problem with hugging my dad or, or even hugging any one of you men. And I, I love you as a brother in Christ, but that's not what they love. That's not their love. I don't want to get used to seeing a, a man trying to look like a woman or a woman trying to look like a man and, and thinking that they are and it's okay. Or, or men thinking they can compete in women's sports. I don't, want to, I don't want to get used to that. I don't want to think it's okay. But that's what the world is getting used to. They've seen it enough. It's, it's been in front of them enough that pretty soon that's going to be normal. And in fact, it is normal in many places. Their agenda is that. But what's God saying? What, what does God want us to do about it? I don't condone their lifestyle. I, I, I don't appreciate it. I don't want it to influence and affect my, my family, my church. But what, does, what is God's heart? about people that are in sin, just in general. Did Jesus Christ go out of his way to ignore a group of people that were publicans and sinners? No. What did he do? He had lunch with them. 
And he didn't ever say, it's okay that you're that way. And he didn't ever say, it's okay that you stole from people. And he, he never said it was okay that you were a harlot or that you committed adultery. He never condoned their sin, but he always wanted to deal with their problems and show them who he was and win them to himself. Because the Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some men count slackness, but his long suffering to us were. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You mean God wants Muslims to be saved? Yes, he does. And he wants Buddhists and Hindus and homosexuals and transgender folks. And the answer to everything is people coming to a relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus says in Mark chapter 10 and verse number 6, from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. He's clear about that. And if God would have wanted it any other way, he'd have made it that way. He declares that Sodom is sinful and wicked exceedingly. He destroys these cities because of their great wickedness. You know how long-suffering and patient God is? even with this sin. And we classify sins. We say, oh, that's so much worse. And it's outward and it's unnatural and, and I know that and, I, I, and, and it bothers me to see it. But does it bother me when I sin? Sin is sin. Sin separates us from God. It doesn't matter how great or how small we see it. It doesn't matter if it's outward or if it's inward. The pride of my heart is just as wicked as their open, blatant pride. You know how patient God is? In Genesis chapter 18, when Abraham stands before God and he prays that God would save Sodom. Now, I don't know that Abraham knew the extent of the wickedness that was there. And he prayed, Lord, is there 50 there? Would you save the city for 50 righteous? All the way down so Lord, let, don't be angry, Lord. I'll ask this one, one more time. Lord, if there's 10, think how good God is. Lot, Mrs. Lot, two, two girl children, maybe two others that were married to two other, I don't, I've been trying to figure that out, but. If all of them knew the Lord, if all of those were righteous, that's eight people. Lord, if they've just reached two people the whole time they've been there. Lord, if they've been able to talk to two people and they've, they've come away from their sin and repented and come to you, Lord, would you save that city? And God says, yes, I'll save it for ten. Why? Because God is not about destroying people. God is about saving people. Do you want to reach some? I want you to think about a second thing. Not only do you want to reach them, but how can we reach them? How can we reach people that are so in their sin and so in denial that it is sin and so set in their ways and every time we talk to them they think that we hate them when we don't and we shouldn't. How can we reach them? Let me give you just a few thoughts this morning. Number one, with consistency. If we're going to reach people that are in bondage to this sin, we've got to be consistent. You know what needs to be consistent about our lives? Our message. This is not our message. We're not preaching a message of hate. God does not hate sinners. Because for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. If God hated sinners, then God hates me. Sin is sin to God, and, and if they will recognize that that is sin, if they will turn to the Lord, we've got to be faithful in our message that God loves the world, but God cannot. 
be okay with sin. It's God's message. It's not our message. And sometimes we're so hard on the sin of others, and we're not very hard on our own sin, but we're so hard on the sin of others that we push them away from God. Yes, sin is terrible and wicked, and sin, their sin will send them to hell if they've not had it paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ, and they need to get right with God. That's the truth. We've got to be consistent in our message. We can't change. This world wants us to change. It wants us to accept it. It wants us to bring it in and say it's okay. It wants us to change what the Bible says. But the, the truth of the matter is we can't change what God has said. We've got to stand on the truth and keep standing on the truth. And the, the longer we live and the more accepted this becomes, the more radical we're going to appear. We're not hating people. Our message has to be consistent. Our ministry must be consistent. That means we're not just trying to reach the people that we want to reach or reach the people that look like they, they would receive our message or not just picking up those that, that really are nice and, and kind and clean and, 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 and have it all together already. No, we've got to reach those. We've got to go into the highways and hedges and compel the lame and the halt and the blind and reach as many as we can regardless of how they identify or who they are or what they've done. Our ministry has to be consistent, reaching all the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Every creature. If we're going to reach them, I believe our marriages need to be consistent. You know the greatest thing that will help our children to know what marriage ought to be? To see a marriage that's what it ought to be. Sometimes I, I fear for my children and what they're going to see and hear and the things they're going to be tempted with that seem so much greater than things that I dealt with as a child. You know what they need to see? They need to see that my wife and I love each other. We're faithful to one another. You know, the world needs to see a church full of faithful marriages, 50 and 60, and if they live long enough, 70 years married. Because marriage is between one man and one woman. God said it that way. They need consistency. When we preach one way and we live another way, that's not consistent. When we say this is what God says and we don't minister to all those that God says we're supposed to minister, that's not consistent. You know what they need? They need to see that, that we really believe what we say we believe. They need consistency. If we're going to reach them, we must be consistent. Number two, if we're going to reach them, we must have compassion. Jude says this, and of some, have compassion. Making a difference. We can love the person and not love their actions. We can care where that person spends eternity without condoning what they've done. I believe God's a loving God. Why? Because the Bible tells me so. Again and again through the scriptures we find that he's merciful of loving kindness and repentance to him of the evil when people will repent and turn to God. I believe God can save anyone. If he saved me or if he saved you, then he can save anybody else. We're no better than anyone else is. And we may have been saved 30, 40, 50, 60 years. And we may be living, a, as we look at it, a pretty good kind of life. And we can compare ourselves to others. And we're not as bad as they are. But the truth of the matter is, if God saved us, it took no less a miracle than it would to save anyone else. We need compassion. Christ showed Compassion. He went out of his way to seek a sinner like the woman at the well who had five husbands was living with another man that wasn't her husband. And he knew that before he ever struck up a conversation with her. Yet what did Jesus do? If you just have asked of me, I'd have given you the living water. Sir, give me this living water. Are, are you greater than our father Jacob? He was. He didn't have to go to Samaria. He didn't have to sit on the well at Sychar. Why did he do it? To reach that woman for Christ. 
to reach that city for Christ. If we're going to reach Sodom, we've got to be consistent. We've got to have compassion. We've got to do it without compromise. We can't give in to their demands if we're going to reach them. We can't let down our guard if we're going to reach them. I want you to turn to Genesis 19, and I want to read just a few verses of the story that we find Lot dealing with. And I'm not, I don't really want you to, to think I'm looking down on Lot because any one of us could get caught in, in the trap and temptation of sin. In fact, Peter tells us that he was just Lot, that he was righteous Lot, that his soul was vexed every day in the things that he saw and heard. And I can imagine my soul gets pretty troubled as well in the things I see and hear. But I believe he compromised. He gave in. He tried to appease them. In verse 4 of chapter 19, it says, but, for, but before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came into thee this night? Bring them out unto us, that we may know them. And Lot went out at the door unto them and shut the door after him. He said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. Behold, now I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you. And do ye to them as is good in your eyes, only unto these men do nothing. For therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. And they said, Stand back. They said again, This one fellow came in to sojourn, and he will needs be a judge. Now will we deal worse with thee than with them. And they pressed sore upon the man, even Lot came near to break the door. Now he sought to tell them this is, this is wickedness. This is something that you shouldn't do. This is the very reason I brought these men into my house to protect them from this. But he offered them his daughters instead. Thank God they didn't receive that. Do you know what Lot, Lot lost? He lost his testimony. He was telling them the truth. Don't do this, man. This is wickedness. Hopefully that wasn't the first time he'd ever said that. But even so, they didn't listen. He lost his testimony with his sons-in-law. When he goes, as the angels are hastening them out of the city because God's going to destroy the city by fire, he goes to his son-in-law. He says, get up out of this place. God's going to destroy it. And the Bible says he seemed to them as one that mocked. God, God's going to destroy this place? You see, he hadn't lived a life to prove how real God was to him. He hadn't been faithful to preach the truth that God is not pleased with this living. He hadn't, I don't think his sons-in-law were this.